What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. We have got another grab bag episode today, guys. I'm excited. So the way we do these is we kind of have one central theme, but we all tackle a different hypothetical question within that theme. So each of us, instead of all answering the same question, are going to be answering three different questions on the same topic. And our grab bag topic for today is water. Exciting. Mm. Makes a big splash. Um, Hey, he did it. (laughs) Got there. So, Ben, why don't you lead us in with the very first water question? Yeah, so so I looked at, uh, the question I looked at was, what if the ocean were fresh water instead of salt water? So first off, elephant in the room, we're all going to die, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> wow, jumping right to the end there, huh? And whenever you make that big of a difference, a bit that big of a change, most likely everyone's going to die. <laughs> No, definitely. Everyone's going to die. <laughs> We've gone through this before uh, in an old episode. So I'll, I'll go through it again a little bit um, just so we can get this one out of the way and then get some other other possibilities. But um, if we just took like our current everyday ocean, you know, like you do use every day of your life and take all the salt out of it, we're all going to die because all of the plants and animals that live in salt water evolved to live in salt water. And the vast majority of them would die in fresh water. So they're all what are called uh, stenohaline organisms, which means they, they can only live in a very narrow range of salinity or saltiness, to use non-scientific terms. There are some exceptions. These are called urohaline organisms. Sometimes they're things that live in like, like a tide pool where it switches between being fresh water and salt water, so they have to be able to survive both. Um, other times, the more common ones probably are ones that live most of their lives in either fresh water or salt water, but then have to migrate to the other to spawn for some reason. I don't know why this they evolved this way. It doesn't really make much sense, but that's a thing. Maybe because they, they think they're predators that live in the same environment. They could put their eggs in like a spot they couldn't get to. And like, ha, you can't live out here. But there's still predators in other places. I don't know. Whatever. They don't think very far. They're fishes. Yeah. So it's like salmon live in salt water, migrate to fresh water to spawn. Um, North America and European eels apparently live in fresh water and migrate out to salt water to spawn. So I guess those, those guys might survive. Literally everything else would die. <laughs> Literally just <laughs> eels. <laughs> yeah. Eels, eels and salmon <laughs> and like some crabs. And this is a problem. Everything dying in the ocean because there's a couple of reasons. One, the one that I know that we talked about before is, is that, is that one of those things is phytoplankton, which are these little microscopic plants that just float around in the ocean. And they provide 50 to 85% of our oxygen, which is a lot. It's also a big range. Get on it, scientists. I know. You hope it would be a little more precise with all the science, but, you know, what are you going to do? But uh, also on top of that, you're going to have all these these dead fish and whatnot decomposing. And that decomp- decomposition process takes oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide. So in addition to losing all this oxygen production, um, we're going to have even less oxygen because all it's all going to get sucked into these decomposing fish. So... Everything dies. It's a bad time. We're not going to focus on that. We're going to move past it because it's actually possible to have freshwater oceans. On our very planet, we used to have freshwater oceans. 3.8 billion years ago, when the planet first cooled down to the point where it was actually cool enough for the water to condense, all the water on the planet was freshwater. There was there was no salt in the water. That's back when we didn't have to worry about everyone dying. Right. Exactly. Because there wasn't anyone. Yay. <laughs> Because they would have died from the terrible, terrible everything else about the planet. But, you know, point being, doesn't matter. And it being too hot for water to be there. <laughs> right, yeah. So water all shows up. Well, it doesn't show up. Water all condenses into oceans, and it's all fresh water. Um, but then as the water cycle starts, and water starts evaporating, going up into the atmosphere, it starts, while it's up in the atmosphere, it is absorbing some of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And then when it falls as rain, that rain is slightly acidic. 
and that acidity erodes the rocks as it flows over it. And without erosion, it pulls out salts and minerals. And those stay in the water, get dragged out to rivers and streams, and then from there out into the oceans. And the water cycle keeps going and, and salt keeps getting, you know, eroded out of rocks and pulled on down. But that salt can't get sucked up with the water when it evaporates. So all that salt just keeps getting pulled bit by bit over 3.8 billion years into the ocean to the point where we've reached this current level of salty ocean. So really, it's it's the rocks that were the first, you know, ocean dumpers. It wasn't us. Yeah, right. They dumped in the Charles. I shouldn't make that joke because it only makes sense to anyone who has lived specifically in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, fun bonus thing. Anyone living in Boston. You got that one. I don't even get it. I live in Boston. I know the Charles exists. I just don't know dumping it in the Charles. Oh, there's like all these like little signs and stuff all over Boston that say don't dump in the Charles. There's like little like... um like drains with like a little picture of a fish and it says don't dump in the charles it's great anyway oh they got they got those in other places too new york has them don't oh, okay just don't jump a river it's a bad idea anyway don't do that why the rocks did it though well the rocks did it blame rocks rocks suck that's the main takeaway here point being we're going to say that that didn't happen that for whatever reason there is no salt in the oceans and that's just how the planet evolved right so what's that actually do one big one that comes up immediately is that the way that like early people settled like their settlements is going to be very different because one of the big like constraints on where you can live is access to fresh water. And suddenly it's fucking everywhere. <laughs> right now, like 97.5% of the water in the world is salt water. So we suddenly have an impossibly larger amount of fresh water available. So every coast is suddenly super easy to, to um, you know, settle on because you will always have fresh water. Man, fuck rocks. I know, right? It's all these rocks. <laughs> Damn it, rocks. They made things so much harder for us. We got caught between rocks in a hard place. <laughs> they just wanted us to be strong like them. <laughs> so that that seems like a good thing. And also, you know, we have all these concerns ongoing of like the demand for fresh water. I think it, it is like the demand for fresh water doubles every like 20 years right now or something. And like it's an actual concern going forward. That wouldn't be a concern. So everything seems good. Unfortunately, there are also bad impacts from this lack of salt in the water. The biggest one being that the saltiness of the ocean is a big thing that makes the like inter-ocean currents work. So these currents, you know, they, they pull hot water up from the equator up to the poles and then cold water down from the poles back to the equator in this big loop, which sort of keeps the temperature of the planet regulated because of this movement of, of, of water. And one of the things that makes them work is the salinity of the ocean, because up near the poles, it's cold enough for the water to freeze. And when the water freezes, much like when it evaporates, that salt can't stay in it. So that salt drops down and the salt level in the water that doesn't freeze increases and it becomes more dense. And when it becomes more dense, it drops and that makes space for that warm water from the tropics to move up. So without that salt... That's some of it might still happen just just due to, you know, there's like wind impacts and there are some just heat based impacts, but it is a big component. And there's definitely going to be a lot less of this ocean current. And this is going to cause a lot of things. The big thing it's going to cause is that there's going to be a lot less regularity in the temperature of the planet and or the ocean in general or the ocean in the planet in general, I guess. Right. So right now the oceans stay pretty regular temperature because of this movement of water. That's not going to happen anymore. It's going to go through sort of more phases as it happens a little more randomly. It's kind of, there's not a huge amount of research on this because it's not going to just happen overnight. Obviously there actually are some concerns about it happening because of um, the ice caps melting. It's affecting the salinity of the water and the poles, but so there's been some research, but not like a huge amount, but it, it's definitely going to, more than anything, cause much more severe storms and hurricanes and stuff, which is going to be bad, obviously, because they're already pretty bad. But the other thing that we could get to because of this lack of salt in the water and then this lack of ocean currents is that, have you ever noticed that the ocean doesn't freeze? Like it does obviously up by the poles, but you know, we live near the coast. The rivers near us will freeze. I think that that'll happen, but the ocean doesn't freeze, right? Right. Yep. So... A big part of this is that, well, a part of this is the fact that that salt actually reduces the freezing point of the water. 
So because of the solid concentration of the ocean, the freezing point of the water drops from, it's not a huge amount, but it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit for just, you know, regular, you know, filtered water to about 28 degrees Fahrenheit with that salt water, which on its own obviously is not enough to cause the oceans to ice over because it gets that cold and the oceans don't freeze. But we also wouldn't have those currents keeping the temperatures balanced. So that doesn't make up all of the reason that the, the oceans don't freeze over. Some of it also is just like the sheer volume of water. It holds a lot of energy. But because of that, there are probably points in winter as this, you know, lack of current causes temperature fluctuations that we would get pretty heavy surface icing on the ocean farther up like the northern parts of the coast. Which would be bad because, as I mentioned, we'd probably have more settlements there. <laughs> uh, and they would probably rely on having that access to, to the, the fresh water, uh, which isn't ideal. So that's not the biggest impact. The bigger one is probably the lack of ocean currents that will probably over time eventually kill us all still, even though we don't die immediately. But that oh, was kind of cool. The, the ocean's icing over a little bit thing. It's neat. Yeah, I like it. But yeah, so I guess, long story short, we probably still do die due to a lack of temperature regulation of the planet and massive storms and, you know, cough, cough, all the effects that people say are going to have for global warming, cough, cough. Um, but <laughs> it's it's not immediately fatal, which is cool. And hey, we can live more places. So that's nice. Uh, Chris, what did you answer? Yeah, so my question, my water-related question was, what if it stopped raining? Does everyone die? We probably would all die, yes. <laughs> yeah, <Yay. laughs> it's probably a thing. <laughs> New format. We say if we're all going to die first so that people don't have to be sad at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to try my best to come up with a solution so we don't all die. So, yes, we need water to survive. That is a thing. So, uh, normally right now, obviously, water evaporates from the ocean, and that's part of the water cycle, and then it, it moves over land and rains on the land, and that's... That's like a main way that we get water. If this doesn't happen anymore, how can we get our water? So as Ben mentioned, on Earth, 97.5% of the water is salt water, and then the rest is fresh. When the water evaporates from the ocean, that's kind of like a conversion from salt water to fresh water. And that's not happening anymore in our case, which is a problem. So basically all the salt water in the ocean in our scenario where it doesn't rain is basically useless to us in terms of like usable drinking water for us. God damn rocks ruining it. again. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so I want to see, is it even possible to survive without rain at all? Uh, and to find this, I, I looked up the driest city in the world and I found, I feel like I should know how to pronounce this, but I don't. It's Aswan, Egypt. I've I've seen the name of the city before. I've just never tried to say it out loud. Aswan doesn't sound right. <laughs> is, it, uh, is it spelled A S S W A N? It's A S W A N. Aswan. 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 Oh man, this is bad. <laughs> doesn't it feel like I should? We should know how to pronounce this. I'm trying to Google it. <laughs> I'm gonna say Aswan. <laughs> but anyway, this city has less than one millimeter of rain each year on average. Less than one millimeter is very, very, very little. And then it there was a streak of no rain at all between 1994 and 2001. So that's a that's seven a long year, time. Yeah, it's a seven year streak where they had no rain at all. <laughs> Jeez, who broke a mirror? <laughs> yeah, I know. In addition to this, they're also the least humid, one of the least humid cities in the world, and they're one of the sunniest cities in the world. So they get almost 4,000 hours of annual sunshine, which is almost the maximum theoretical duration of sunshine that you can get possible. <laughs> they almost the get The maximum nice. theoretical amount of sunshine. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but despite all this, they still have 290,000 people living there. So how do they get their water? So the city is actually like right next to the Nile River. So obviously that's, that's their main source of water is the Nile River. But that water from the Nile River has to come from somewhere, so I want to trace it back to its source. And there are a bunch of like smaller rivers that kind of branch off, and they, they all feed into the Nile River. 
that's kind of how like rivers work. They start really small and then they build into each other until they're big. But all these small rivers, they end like their source, their end source is at mountains, tops of mountains, which makes sense because mountains are basically like the natural water towers of the world. So they naturally distribute water throughout the land through rivers. So there's like one good guy. The big rocks are good guys. All the little (laughs) rocks suck. (laughs) Well, the big rocks still contribute to the salt problem in the ocean. Uh, But the little rocks I imagine are the salty ones. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so the the tops of mountains is the source of the water in the rivers. But where is the water coming from on the tops of the mountains? And the answer is rain. And that's where we hit our roadblock in my answer because we don't have rain anymore. So we need to somehow replace this rain at the tops of mountains uh, with something else. So rainwater isn't the only way we get fresh water. There's also groundwater. And 30.1% of fresh water is actually groundwater. So we can pump the groundwater up to the tops of the mountains. That was my, like, my theory. I have in parentheses in my notes, like a water slide. <laughs> <laughs> or, I don't know, a river. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's basically what a water slide is doing because the slide is a river part and then it pulls at the bottom and then we pump it back up to the top. It's a continuous cycle. It's a water cycle. So I looked for like strong pumps because we need to pump them up to the tops of mountains. It's, you need a strong pump. And the strongest one I found was made by Fair- another thing I don't know how to pronounce. Fairbanks Nijwis. Nijwis? Fairbanks, I know, but the second word is N I J H U I S. Nijuis. I'm going to say Nijuis. This is a company. They make pumps. And this strongest pump can pump 60,000 liters per second, which is a lot. <laughs> that, is a, that, is a, that is a lot. Holy shit. Yeah. I'm just imagining like a liter of like soda, like a two liter bottle, and then 30,000 of those. Of those. Oh yeah, two. Well, yeah, thirty thousand two liter v- bottles, and then just like every second per second, like one, two, <laughs> and there's like each of that's like just this giant wall of two liter soda. soda bottles going through. Right. So th- that's the capability of this pump. That unit of measurement isn't really that useful for what we need. What we're looking for is more uh, pressure head is the more important thing. Pressure head is basically just how high the the pump can pump the water, and I couldn't find the number for this strongest pump in terms of pressure head i looked on their website they didn't have the strongest pump on their website because it's probably like a special case where they only made it once and they don't actually sell it but they did have other pumps on their website and i looked through a bunch of them and the highest pressure head that i could find on their website was 820 feet so their strongest pump can pump water 820 feet high now how tall or how how high do we need to actually pump it the average land elevation above sea level is 2,756 feet. And then the, wa- the water table depth varies a lot, depending on where you are. But they took a bunch of samples, and two-thirds of the samples were less than 100 feet deep. And that depth spiked up when you got to, like, hills and mountains, which makes sense because just because the land is going up on a mountain, the water table isn't going to go up with the mountain. That doesn't really make sense if that happened. So... I'm going to say 100 feet plus the average elevation is kind of like an average of what we need to to do for our pump, which is like 2,856 feet. And our pump only does 820 feet, so it's not quite there. But the thing is that pumps can work in series of each other. So if you have a pump, if you have one pump after the other in the same system... Um, the flow rate stays the same, but the pressure head is additive. So if you have two pumps, then you get twice the pressure head, and you can pump it twice as high. Excuse me, Nijuia. I would like three of your largest pumps, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's for the the average. But if we want to get, because I want to do all cases, so I looked at Mount Everest, and if we want to get to the top of Mount Everest, we're going to need 36 of these pumps, around 36 of these pumps. So it's doable. There's a lot of pumps, and these are giant pumps, but it's sort of doable. Obviously, there's going to be logistical issues, like you're basically coring out the middle of um, of Mount Everest to put in pipes, which isn't the easiest thing to do. But in terms of pumps, we can do it. <laughs> we got pumps. <laughs> Once we have pumps, we can do everything else. Yeah. So 
great, we can we can pump the groundwater up to the top of the mountain. So the thing is that groundwater is generally recharged from sources of surface water. So like surface water includes lakes and rivers and swamps. So some of that seeps through the soil and that like replenishes the groundwater. But if that replenishment doesn't happen fast enough, then pumping the groundwater can lower the water table and it can deplete the, the water supply, which isn't good. And this leads to my next question. If we have like rivers and stuff and they're not rep- replenishing the groundwater, where is the rest of that water going? And the answer to that is back to the ocean. So all of the rivers usually eventually end up back in the ocean and they mix back in with the salt water. And normally this is this doesn't matter because we have evaporation and the conversion back to fresh water. But in our case, we don't have that conversion anymore. So if it mixes back with the ocean, then it becomes useless. So we have to prevent it from mixing back into the ocean. So my idea, what I propose, is that we build a giant moat around the entire land of everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) A moat around the entire land of everywhere. Yeah. So the total volume of fresh groundwater and surface water combined in the world is around 2.5 million cubic miles. So that's like kind of the maximum amount of fresh water that we'll need to store ever. We probably won't ever hit that number because uh, there will, some of the water will always be like in rivers or like in pipes and stuff. But theoretically, if like our pumps stopped for whatever reason and all the rivers flowed back into the moat, that's the maximum amount of water we need to hold in our moat. So I looked at the, the amount of coastline we have in the world and we have 722,000 miles of coastline, which means that if our moat is one mile deep and 3.5 miles wide, we'll be able to store all the water we need within our moat. That's a big moat. It is a big moat. <laughs> you might be thinking that that one mile is a really, really, really deep body of water for not being the ocean. And you're right, it is. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I absolutely know that is a very deep hole. <laughs> yes. But it's not unheard of because there is there is one lake called Lake Baikal. Another word I don't know how to pronounce. I think it's Baikal. Baikal in Siberia. This is the deepest lake in the world. And it is the deepest part of it is 5,387 feet deep, which is just over a mile. So one mile deep is not unheard of. This river is actually 49 miles wide, so that's not unheard of either. It's really the length of just going around the entire world, but we're going to ignore that part as the term in terms of ridiculousness, because we have to. <laughs> so the one mile deep and 3.5 miles wide is kind of doable. And if we have a moat that collects all the surface water on the edge of our land, it can feed all of our fresh water back into the groundwater supply. We can pump that groundwater back up to the, the mountains and the water table stays steady. And then all that fresh water can, can flow through rivers again naturally. Um, and that flows back into our moat. And we have a cycle. We have a water cycle. Instead of a water cycle in the atmosphere, we have a water cycle underground, an underground water cycle. What about those gosh damn rocks? They're going to turn our moat into salt water again. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> it is a matter of time. I didn't take into account the rocks. In 3.8 billion years, we're going to be in trouble, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was not aware of the rock. Why problem. didn't you come up with a long-term solution? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know why you didn't realize that rocks were the problem, because my answer has no rocks in it. <laughs> yes, Marcus, walk us through your not rock question. Yeah. Only paper and scissors. But no, the, the question I did was, what if the Earth was entirely made out of water? So, first off, we go on and on about the oceans being, like, really, really big on the show. Because, yes, the oceans are very big. But when we recalibrate to, you know, the Earth and, like, space sizes, the oceans are actually really, really small. <laughs> So the mass of water on Earth makes up only 0.05% of its total mass. In fact, Earth doesn't even have the most ocean of the objects in our solar system. Uh, Jupiter's moon Ganymede has a subterranean layer of ice and water outside its iron core that's 10 times deeper than Earth's oceans and has like, you know, 16 times more water in it than we have in all of our oceans combined. See, one mile deep isn't that deep. (laughs) (laughs) Not that deep. So... 
I was going to say, okay, not 0.05%. What if 100% of the Earth was made of water? So, first, the way I scaled it up is I'm going to keep the total mass of Earth the same and scale it to that. So, the density of Earth is about 5,500 kilograms per meter cubed, and water is a little less than a fifth of that at 997 kilograms per meter cubed. So, because it's less dense, it's going to result in the water Earth being a bit bigger, and once you do that mass math out, the radius of the Earth goes from 6378, which it is now, to 11,266, just a little bit less than doubling. So, water Earth, twice as big. But that's slightly oversimplified, because that counts the whole world staying as liquid water. Um, so, so let's take a second to look at what would happen at the planet's core. The pressure at any given point um, is equal to the total weight of everything above it that's pushing down on it. So if you go 10 feet underwater, your pressure is equal to the 10 feet of water that's above you. So as a result, conveniently, our core pressure is going to be about the same as Earth's because we have the same amount of mass in a sphere around it. Weight mass-wise, there's going to be the same amount of mass over us, so the pressure is going to stay the same. The core of the Earth is under a pressure of 330 to 360 gigapascals, which, to give it a little context, is over 3 million times the standard atmospheric pressure at sea level. For some reason, I thought you were going to say gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> 360 gigabytes. Almost one-third of a hard drive. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's a, lot of, it's a lot of pressure. A human being can survive a pressure of 0. 0.0027 gigapascals before being crushed. And the deepest part of the ocean is at a pressure of 0. 0.1 gigapascals. So the core of the Earth, thousands of times more pressure than even the deepest part of the ocean. So... The question becomes, what happens to the water? So, at the bottom of the ocean, the water's still water. That's, you know, that makes sense. All good. But at really high pressures, water starts to do some weird stuff. For us, in this case, at pressures over 100 gigapascals, water turns into ice X. Not just, uh, sorry, not ice X, ice 10. <laughs> I'm going to have to <laughs> adjust to, to Roman numerals, because that's how they're written out. So... Not just ice, ice 10. Turns out there are 18 different types of ice, and we only ever get to see one of them, which is hexagonal ice or ice H. That's the one, you know, your, the your drink freezes, ice. snow, all that. It's all, it's not boring. It makes nice snowflakes and things. It's not ice X, though. Yeah, it's not, it's not ice X, which I, I think I might just call it ice X. That's it's so much cooler, cooler to call yeah. it ice X. If, if we had a marketing department, they would call it ice X. They would. But besides the cool name, <laughs> um, Ice 10 is, a, is cool from a chemistry point of view. And I might be the only one excited about this, but I'm going to go into it a little bit. So generally, when water freezes, Ice H forms into these nice hexagonal crystal, crystals and creates a shape where the, the positive charge of the hydrogens on the one side of the, of the water molecule line up with the negative sides of the um, oxygen molecules. And so you get these nice hydrogen bonds that form the hexagonal shape. And the way the grid works is it actually is less dense because they, they align you know away from each other a little bit it's actually a little bit less dense than just water freely you know flowing around itself so that's why ice expands um, instead of compacts when you when it goes from a liquid to a solid ice 10 is taking that whole hexagonal structure and crushing it down so ice 10 is actually two and a half times as dense as water so one one of the key properties of water in you know our normal day to day lives is that it's not very compressible. Like you can't take a bottle of water and squeeze it tight. You know you can't squish it because the water has no place to go. You can't compress the water and make it you know less you know more dense unless you're in the middle of a planet. So first cool thing here is that the structure is now cubic instead of hexagonal. So instead of being these nice hexagons, it actually forms this like three D cubic matrix. So it's down to squares. And the second thing I find cool about this is that each of the oxygen molecules is now bonded to four hydrogens instead of two. So almost like H4O instead of H2O. And it still makes a balanced atom because what happens is it's so tightly compacted that two oxygens are actually sharing the same hydrogens in this lattice. So you basically have half of four hydrogens instead of all of two of them to make your molecule work. Is that still considered water? Yes. Well, it's ice. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah, ice yeah. 10. Right. <laughs> That's just some cool science shit. Because I, I was having fun reading about ice 10. So 
the inner core, 330 gigapascals, way more than 100 you need to make ice 10. So definitely the inner core of our Earth is going to be ice 10. But how much of the rest of the Earth will be? Like I said before, since pressure is roughly the same as the weight of material above it, it's basically linear from um, the surface to the core. So it just changes linearly with depth. So because the 100 gigapascals, which forms ice 10, is a little less than a third of 360, which is our max, about the inner two-thirds of our water planet is going to be made up of a solid crystal of ice 10. It's just going to be like a big water diamond in the middle. Just outside of that, where the pressures are between like, well actually, between 0 0.5 and 100, um, we're going to have a layer of ice 8, which is just a less extreme version of ice 10, followed by a quick jumble of various ice 15, ice 3, ice 5, ice 11, and ice 6. Why are these numbers all jumping around? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> scientists are bad at what they do. Just kidding. I love to be scientists. You're great. I have a really cool phase diagram that shows the, the types of ice you have at different temperatures and pressures, and it's just, it's a mess. But anyway, they're all, they're all just different um, lattices that the earth, that the, the water can form. Ice 8 is kind of cool because it's basically ice, except you have two separate ice lattices intertwined with each other. So, like, you have, like, imagine the hexagons, and then hexagons looping through the hexagons. And, like, it's like a double water, which is kind of cool. Um, and the rest are just kind of variations on that theme. But we don't get back to um, regular water and ice until we hit a pressure of 0 0.5 gigapascals. So we have just all these crazy ices until we get just 15 kilometers below the surface out of our, you know, 11,000 kilometer radius. So let, let's take a look at that. The first question is, is it going to be cold and ice, or is it going to be kind of warm and be water and liquid? Because at, this temp at, at these pressures, it's more about the temperature. And if you're basically above freezing, uh, you're going to have water. And if you're below freezing, you're going to have ice. Look at that, some science. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. So the first thing I looked at, looking at planet scales, is the Earth's core is very hot. So why... Is the Earth's core hot? I actually didn't know that. There's three main reasons. One is basically the initial heat of when the Earth formed, of all the different bits and rocks and gases and vapors in the in the early solar system coming together and compressing into you know an Earth ball. A lot of heat generate there. That's part of it. Number two is the friction of the moving parts. So Earth has a you know a liquid iron core that spins around. Um, and then also, actually, a lot of this heat is generated from early Earth, where the denser parts of the, the denser metals, like the iron, um, like, you know, the denser rocks, would go from the outside towards the inside, and actually them pulling into the center generates a lot of, the, a lot of that heat percentage. And then number, number three is the radioactive isotopes in the planet's core that, you know, emit, emit radiation and generate heat. So... This, this is just this was just fun because this number surprised me. What do you guys think is the leading heat factor of these three? It's initial heat forming that is held onto, the friction of all the parts moving inside the Earth, or the radioactive isotopes. Which one do you think is the most? Oh, the way you phrase this question makes me think it's probably the coolest sounding one should be the radioactive <laughs> isotopes. I would say the initial heat. All right. What do you guys think? What percentage of that of that heat do you think is it for those two? So, Chris, what do you think it is for the initial heat? How much, um, what percentage? It's got to be dramatic if you're asking us. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say 99%. <laughs> ben? Ooh. How much do you think is radiation? 87%. <laughs> ben, you're actually close. Yes. <laughs> I went too dramatic. <laughs> the radioactive isotopes in the planet's core account for 90% of the Earth's heat. I was actually really close. Wow, cool. <laughs> With the uh, the remaining ten being split fairly evenly between the initial heat and the friction of the of the uh, of the things coming together, so I was way off. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but, I mean, the way I phrase it, you guys did did metagame it and pick high numbers. Well, yeah. So, in our ice planet, we're not really going to have the second two. We're not going to have the, the the moving parts because we're one giant ice crystal, and we don't really have any radioactive isotopes. So we're really really going to have the initial heat due to the accretion. So you know, simplifying it down, because there's no way I'm getting real numbers on this, we're going to have 5% of the Earth's heat in our core. 
So rather than the 10,000 degrees that the Earth's core is going to be, it's going to be more like 500 degrees Celsius. So just looking at that, I'm like, okay, so our planet's going to be cold enough that there won't be any liquid water on our water planet. And I was kind of bummed out. Turns out, though, the heat of the Earth's core only makes up 0.03% of Earth's energy budget at the surface. So the Earth is basically not heated at all at the surface level from its core, with the vast majority of it being from the sun's heat. So almost all of the, the, you know, the temperature of our planet is decided based on the sun. So really, not too much is going to change. Except for all the water. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And in fact... Oceans are much better at absorbing heat than land because the water, the the radi- the sun's rays can really penetrate into the water, and the water is very good at storing heat. So, if anything, the global temperature will actually increase by a smidge because we're because the ocean can absorb that much more water. This is balanced against not having any of the um, like carbon dioxide gases or any of the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, it's still kind of a tight knit thing whether we're going to have ice or water covering our planet, I think it's going to be water. So we have a layer of water, about 15 kilometers deep. Then we have a bunch of cool ices before we get to our big-ass ice 10 diamond in the middle. But could you actually live on this planet? I was just about to ask that because you didn't, he didn't establish in the beginning whether everyone dies or not. I was very curious. <laughs> I did forget. You guys didn't call me out on it. <laughs> so I did forget to mention it. So we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep them in, in suspense for a little bit. So... The other big difference between our ice 10 core and the Earth's iron core is that ours will be a solid. And what a nice liquid metallic core gets you is a magnetosphere. So the liquid iron in the Earth's core is spinning around along with the momentum of the spinning planet. And that rotation with, those, um, with the iron creates a magnetic field. Uh, that magnetic field helps protect us from solar winds and ensures that nasty sun radiation from the sun doesn't make it to the surface because there's the sun there's lots of stuff from the sun that makes the surface but some of the nastier gamma rays and all that um, are deflected so the first question is can our planet make a magnetic field so our core is not really doing it but we do have a lot of liquid at the surface we have we have 15 kilometers which isn't a huge amount but it is water water can be conductive if you have some amount of salt in it. If it's pure water, we're out of luck because pure water is not a conductive material. But say there's... Rocks, save us now. (laughs) Rocks, help us. (laughs) So I was doing some research on whether a liquid planet could create a magnetic field. Kind of under the assumption that the answer would be no. And the answer turned out to be yes and no. So some of Jupiter's moons, there's like three moons that have subsurface oceans. And they use them to actually generate a magnetic field. But the, the, the big but in here is that the magnetic field is actually induced by Jupiter's magnetic field. So as it goes through Jupiter's magnetic field, the water is conductive enough that the magnetic field it gets from Jupiter messes with it and arranges it enough that it creates its own little magnetic field to kind of counteract that action. But since we don't have a, a big Jupiter that we're orbiting around, our water would not generate a magnetic field that would be anything significant. Plus, again, we, don't, we do have only 15 kilometers of water, so it probably be, even if it was creating it, it probably would not be super great. Uh, so since we don't have that liquid iron core, we're not generating a magnetic field. Because we're not doing that, the solar winds will begin to strip away our atmosphere of, you know, what water vapor, whatever it is. And so as that water vapor gets stripped away, then it hits the surface again, heats up the, the, the surface water, evaporates it, blows it away, and it's going to continuously blast the Earth and blow the vapor away. And it's going to be basically, all that vapor is going to be pushed into space. It's going to be like the world's largest jawbreaker, slowly, slowly <laughs> shrinking down as it, you know, as the sun wears it away. I did, I did try and look at how fast it would shrink to see how long the Earth would last. There are a few too many factors. I, I had gotten pretty far, but it, it involves figuring out how much energy comes from the sun and would be absorbed into the water, you know, per unit of time, which wasn't too bad. But then how much of it would be reflected by our theoretical water vapor slash ice water covered ground, depending on how the math works out. And then comparing that to how much heat would be lost into space just generally over time. 
So there was a couple too many factors to get to figure out how fast it would go, and so I just I just left it as the the, the drifting image of the Earth slowly shrinking. You got too impatient with the jawbreaker and decided to bite into it. Exactly, and now my teeth are a mess. So there are, like I kind of did it starting with liquid water. There are more water based planets kind of in our solar system. For example, uh, Uranus is a water planet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to say Uranus. I did. I have a great Uranus quote here. I'll, I'll, I'll share it in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, Uranus is actually like quite a bit of it is made up of water vapor. But it's a little bit tricky because one, it's far enough away that the water will always be ice even from when it was formed. Two, there's a lot of impurities in it and it has some metals and rocks and things that will affect it. And three, I'm not exactly, I don't know if earth would form also as a gas giant or if the water would be able to compress itself into the the planet shape so there's a couple again a couple too many ifs there planets are fucking complicated which is embodied by what just what just got me like i literally just laughed out loud like while i'm sitting at my desk cold open to a paragraph quote from carol patty an associate professor at georgia tech school of earth and atmospheric sciences uranus is a geometric nightmare (laughs) (laughs) Which just really got me. <laughs> and then she then she tops up, she has a paragraph with, uh, when the magnetized solar wind meets this tumbling field in the right way, it can reconnect, and so Uranus's magnetosphere goes from open to close to open on a daily basis. So there's your Uranus jokes. Had to throw them in there. And now that we have completed that, um, and since there's no atmosphere, everyone dies, and that's hey, the last check dies. mark. That's the last check mark on my little check sheet here, which means we can go into our would you rather question all right ben you ready Mm-hmm. i got a spicy one out of our out of our book of 3000 would you rather questions would you rather battle moby dick or jaws huh uh hmm, uh, hmm. so i actually never read moby dick so i don't know that much about him yeah i don't either i know it's a big old whale yeah <laughs> it's white it's pretty much the extent I was of my knowledge. Hedge, I was kind of hoping you guys would have a little bit of uh, Moby Dick knowledge. <laughs> None of us know anything about Moby Dick. I think we're going to get a bigger understanding of classical literature. Um, Is Moby Dick a, a particularly strong whale? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I think so. I Didn't he, like, wreck he spent Ahab's the entire boat? book fighting it, right? So I don't know how long the book was. I think it was actually pretty short. Well, it's fascinating. Moby Dick with his head out of the water and breaking a boat in half with his jaws. Hmm... I mean, it's a whale, so I imagine it's bigger than the shark. Yeah, I'd agree with that. <laughs> the, exact, the animal's exact dimensions are never given, but the novel claims that the largest sperm whales can reach a length of 90 feet. So it's yeah. a big one. It's Which they one. clarify, larger than any officially recorded sperm whale. Mm, okay. <laughs> so he's a liar is what you're saying. So how big is Jaws? I chased a whale that was this big. Um, <laughs> I know Jaws is also large. Obviously, Jaws is going to be smaller, but... 25 feet in length three tons three tons well he doesn't so so once again i don't read moby dick moby dick um spoiler warning warning does he kill moby dick i don't know (laughs) i never read it moby dick plot at the end of the novel moby dick destroys the pequod ahab and the crew are drowned with the exception of ishmael the novel does not say whether moby dick survives or not hmm in jaws we know jaws gets dies. blown up by dynamite <laughs> yeah so we have a plan of attack there <laughs> i personally don't have any dynamite or a hunting rifle to shoot it with if i remember the plot of jaws correctly i mean i feel like it has to be jaws right how big is jaws it depends on how aggressive they are i guess i don't know how aggressive well, I mean, moby dick is dick is right in his name like <laughs> i feel like he's not a nice so jaws whale. The jaw shark is said to be 25 feet in length. Yeah. Yeah. I already said that. So Moby Dick is 90 feet. Like, I feel like it has to be Jaws. Like, like you're hosed either way, right? Like, there's no well, I mean, I'm pretty sure whales can kill sharks pretty easily. I mean, I don't think a 25-foot shark can kill a 90-foot whale. Ergo, I certainly cannot kill a 90-foot whale. I think, like, in real life, whales actually do kill sharks sometimes. Yeah. But I think it just depends on how aggressive they are to humans. I don't know how aggressive a whale would be to a human. Because whales don't eat 
meat, right? They, uh, I believe that's true. They filter feed. So, I mean, the reason shark attacks happen is because I think people are seals, right? They try to eat the seal. So the shark or the whale is, is more dangerous technically, but I think the shark is more aggressive. So reading the Wikipedia page of Moby Dick, which is the only way to experience (laughs) classic literature, Ishmael insists that what invested the whale was natural terror was an unexampled intelligent malignity in which he has shown in his assaults. So he is aggressive. Yes, he is aggressive. Also, very cool fact I just learned again, because I'm clearly just reading Wikipedia instead of paying attention to you guys. That's fair. Moby Dick is based on a real whale, which was Mocha Dick. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> if you had asked me a... <laughs> what Moby Dick was, I would not have guessed a whale. <laughs> it was a male sperm whale that lived in the Pacific Ocean in the early 19th century. The Wikipedia page I love has like a bit like a bio like a biography page, like you know, sex, born, died, cause of death, killed by whalers. Right. <laughs> Rip. And yeah. Mocha Dick is 70 feet in length, so Moby Dick is 20 feet exaggerated. Uh, I mean, you, you can't you can't fight a whale that's 90 feet long. I'm like, you probably can't fight a shark that's 25 feet long. But this is like, just mechan like scale wise, this is not gonna go well, right? I mean, if you have the right weapons, you can. What is the right weapon to fight a 90 foot sperm whale? A uh, 91 foot sperm whale. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's the thing. Is the added mobility of only being 25 feet long give you the advantage over a bigger, easier-to-hit target of 90 feet? I don't think so. <laughs> How fast can a sperm whale swim? Uh, 22 to 28 miles per hour for a- about an hour. 28 miles per hour. How fast can a shark swim? 25 miles per hour. They're That's about terrifying. the same speed. Yeah, and and the whale weighs a colossal amount more. <laughs> yeah. That's that's like top speed though, right? They might not be as agile. You know, it's kind of funny. I kind of just assumed like not ha- again, not having read Moby Dick. I kind of just assumed the story was that this captain just randomly decided to become obsessed with this whale that was kind of minding its own business and he just wanted to get the big old white whale. Uh didn't realize the whale was a big dick. <laughs> no, yeah, I, Mocha I, Dick. I, I knew that. I feel like that was, yeah. I really knew like nothing about Moby Dick, other than that there was a whale in it. <laughs> I feel much more. I feel much more enlightened, and I, I mean, our show really is all about learning. This is true. I mean, in terms of the, the story, they're basically the same story, right? It's just one's a whale and one's a, a shark. Not exactly. Not really. Yeah, I, I think now having done the the, the the back and forth and our and our modicum of research here. I think it's pretty clear that the, the whale is just nastier. I mean, I feel like even pre-research, I was pretty much on that uh, same page. You were saying shark early on. Wait, I was? What yeah, am I saying shark? You kept saying clearly Jaws, and I was like, no, Oh, no, but... no, clearly you want to fight Jaws. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You clearly want to fight Jaws, because you do not want to mess with a 90-foot whale. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, then I think we're on the same page. Yeah. All right. That was easy. That was a pretty easy decision. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't write the hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, brings us to the end episode. Also, we did a freaking... I just realized we did a, a, a shark whale one in our water episode. We kept it on theme. Oh, yeah, we uh, did. We did that That was completely intentional. But now that we have gotten everything wet with all our water questions... Oh, God, don't say that. It's time for you, the listener, to wet our bills by going on to our Patreon, www.patreon.com slash absurdhypotheticals. And becoming a patron of the show today, it is only one dollar, one fifth the price of a cup of coffee. Can I suggest a different water-themed way to say say this, please? Instead of talking about things being wet. Yeah. Hey, listeners, could you make it rain? Just make it rain. There we go. <laughs> but just one, just, just one, one rain. single. One rain. <laughs> yep, a single rain. A passing shower. <laughs> one hundred pennies. One hundred digital pennies. But if you become a patron, one, it's a super cool way to support the show. We very much appreciate it. But also, you get bonus content. We release a behind-the-scenes episode every month where we talk about making the show, go over the last month's questions. Ben drank some gross-ass milk the last uh, one. No. <laughs> um, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit extra on some answers. You know, I did a little extra research for one of them to answer one of our outstanding questions. So we, we, we try to do lots of little cool stuffs in the, the behind-the-scenes to make it worth your hard-earned dollar. But 
if you don't feel like doing that, there's other ways to help the show. One big way that's relevant for right now is we are, have our 100th episode coming up not too far from now. So for our 100th episode, we are going to be answering 100 hypothetical questions in 100 minutes. The epitome of all lightning rounds. So because we're doing that, we need questions. We need 100 questions to answer. So please, please, please send us a email, uh, absurdhypotheticals at gmail.com. Send us a tweet at Absurd Hype. That's H-Y-P-E, Hype. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash absurdhypotheticals. Send us your questions. They are effectively guaranteed to show up on the show. <laughs> I can't imagine we, any questions that we don't that we can't spend a minute on. So please send them in. And not only will you be featured on the show, we have additional incentives. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about our additional incentive? Our additional incentive is a free audiobook. So I write books, and I have a sci-fi crime thriller called Serial Cortex that I just wrote. It just came out a few months ago. And I have an audiobook version of that, and I have free codes that I'm giving away. So the book itself is about homicide detectives. They go inside the minds of serial killers, Inception style, into a serial killer's mind. So if that's something that sounds like you might be interested in, when you send us a question in your email, just write code please at the end, and I'll send you a free code. And just so everyone else, Chris's books are legit. He, he writes much better books than he does podcasts. podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not your first word either. You have a, you have a bunch of books. I have a bunch out. of so books. So this is a seasoned – books, free books from a seasoned author. Um, but one thing I did forget to mention, we record in the future. So you do not wait to episode 99 to submit your question to us for the 100th episode. It's basically this week and next week, and then we'll have recorded it already. So – before the end of May, please, please, please get your questions in. Don't want to miss your chance. Once we hit June, it is going to be too late. We will have recorded the episode already. And you're, you can still send us your question, but it will not be in the big episode. So just be sure to get it in before the end of May, or else it'll be too late. With that, all that all that good, good marketing, that self-marketing that we do, we bring us the end of the episode. So if you want to hear more of our lovely, lovely voices. Join us next week when we answer the following question. Which museum would win in a fight? It'll make sense, we promise. <laughs> <laughs>